knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? Dr. Mark Plotkin is head of the US-based Amazon Conservation Team. In conversation with Nicholas Ekdahl, he talks about his long-standing work to protect the Amazon's endangered indigenous peoples and how their invaluable knowledge of, among other things, natural medicine can be preserved. The destruction of the Amazon rainforest is it's one of the tragedies of our time and it's disappearing at an alarming rate. Uh, what is humanity losing there? Well, you know, the phrase save the rainforest, that's been around for 30 years, and some people consider that hackneyed. But when I started working in this field in the late 70s and early 80s, there were people who said to me, well, you know, we don't need to worry about the rainforest. We need to worry about population growth. Now I have people say to me, we don't need to worry about the rainforest. We need to worry about climate change. But it's all the same thing. Right. Population growth is destroying ecosystems around the world, not just in the tropics, but the destruction of forests, particularly tropical forests, is driving climate change. So as the shamans would say, you know, it's all interconnected. Right, and is the rate of destruction uh, accelerating these days? Well, the Amazon is a big place, and it's the size of the continental US. So you've had a lot of destruction that's taken place. Estimates are between one quarter and a third of it is either gone or degraded. But you also have many successes out there. And of course, much of the media likes to focus on the bad news because that's what grabs people. But you have uh, national parks still being set up. You have indigenous reserves, which are being better protected all the time through the work of the Amazon Conservation Team, my organization, and others. So like any other complicated issue, there's good news and there's bad news. Right. And speaking about climate change, I mean, when, when the, uh, the forest grows back again, isn't the carbon captured once more or is it lost forever? The problem with history is it's very hard to understand as it's happening, and that's true of ecology as well. So yes, we need more forest. Much of the focus of the conservation movement, at least coming out of the U.S., is no net loss of growth. But my mother was an English teacher. That's two negatives. You really want to do something positive. So first and foremost, you need to protect the primary growth. Secondly, you should be regrowing forest wherever. Third, you should not be degrading forest, which is another big problem. So yes, this is continuing to drive climate change, and part of my frustration is people saying, well, we need to do carbon capture, and we need to create these machines. If there's a problem, rule number one should be don't make it worse. It's sort of like the Hippocratic oath, don't do any harm, then right. you can worry about curing. So priority number one should be protecting the forests that's out there. Priority number two should be regrowing lost forests everywhere, here in Scandinavia, uh, in the Amazon, and everywhere in between. Right, and the Hippocratic angle, uh, there's lots of medical uh, and agricultural products based on uh, compounds derived from neotropical forests, right? Uh, so it's, it's both a scientific and a commercial loss, if you will. What, what, what's being lost in these senses? Well, it shouldn't be either scientific or commercial. To me, conservation around the world is first and foremost an ethical exercise. We shouldn't be destroying ecosystems because we shouldn't. Uh, we suffer physically and spiritually, according to the shamans that I work with, when the environment is destroyed around the world. So it's a spiritual matter. The spiritual aspect of it. And that's one of the reasons that these medicine women and medicine men can sometimes cure things that our own doctors uh, here in Sweden or in the U.S. or uh, much of the industrialized world cannot cure because there's a spiritual component. There's a psychological component. And that's what the shamans are masters of. But they're also masters of the chemicals. And the rainforests hold tens of thousands of species of just plants, millions of species of microorganisms. We now know that shamans are using frogs to heal. We know that shamans are using fungi to heal. This is a completely almost unstudied aspect of rainforest biology and potential hearing. So we should protect rainforests because they're there, but we should also protect it because it's in our own interest, medically, agriculturally, industrially, and spiritually as well. And the tribes living there, they are disappearing at an even quicker rate than the forest itself because of contact with the outside world and so on. There were some 90 
tribes lost in the 20th century in Brazil alone. And just Brazil alone. Right. The Amazon reaches its leafy tendrils into nine countries. Most people, particularly Americans, because we're the worst geographers in the world, think the Amazon is in Brazil. Of course, we also think that everybody in Brazil speaks Spanish and that the Amazon grows up to Mexico. So Americans are not a good measure of how the world actually works. But the, the tribes are disappearing much faster. And the reason we need to be concerned about that from a medical perspective, agricultural perspective, is these are the people that know the plants. If you have a forest with tens of thousands of species, it's like having a book with no index if you don't have the Indians who know which species are used. And I've heard the argument made, well, we have high throughput screening. We can just throw it all in a machine and it'll figure out what chemicals are in there. But what are those chemicals good for? Uh, what's the dosage? What do you mix it with? And what part of the plant do you use? And what season do you harvest it from? These are the people who've spent 10,000 years doing human experimentation, which we can't, and they have certain answers that we don't. Right, and what happened to these 90 tribes and, and their knowledge? Well, what destroys tribes is a variety of factors. First and foremost, obviously, is um, uh, infectious disease. When Indians come into contact with the outside world that haven't had it, they're very susceptible to respiratory ailments. Uh, coughs and colds will kill them, uh, tuberculosis, things like that. And of course, the counter argument that's made by some very short-sighted people was, if their medicine's so good, how come they can't cure these things? Well, they didn't have 10,000 years to experiment on these things because they just showed up with the rest of us. So that's not a fair indictment of their medical systems. Number two, it's cultural shock. When white people go in there and tell them everything they know is wrong, give them infectious diseases, intentionally or unintentionally, and then poison their waters and then destroy all their game, well, of course they get sick and die. So we are following our own nest by allowing these tribes to go extinct through our own ignorance, in some cases almost intentional, in terms of narco-traffickers in, in Colombia and Brazil wanting to wipe them out so they can have access to their forests and the gold that lies underneath. And prospectors of minerals and oil and so forth. You know, there's a particularly distasteful phenomenon in Peru where you have some tribes that are stumbling out of the forest, uncontacted, isolated tribes, because their malocas, their longhouses, have been burned by uh, narco-traffickers and gold miners. And so the Peruvians, the, some evil Peruvians, obviously not all of them, organizing what they're calling human safaris to go meet these uncontacted or barely contacted people and take their picture and, and they give them clothes, which of course carry infectious diseases. So we refer to these as inhuman safaris. Right, right. But is there also sort of a pull factor that, I mean, it's also quite a rough life that they're leading. I mean, they're on the edge, so to speak, in, 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 some, in physical senses. Is, is there also an attraction in plastic bottles and fishing hooks and stuff that draws them away from their traditional lifestyle? Well, there's, there's a couple of questions embedded in what you're asking. First of all, the lifestyle of uncontacted peoples left alone is pretty good. I mean, one of my best friends is an incontacted Indian, or at least he was before he was contacted right before I arrived there 30 years ago. So I have a very good account of what life was like before contact. And we have this uh, European notion of, of, of life being nasty, brutish, and short, and that these people are hungry all the time and they're wandering around in the rainforest looking for something to eat. He said that absolutely wasn't the case. They're master hunters, so they ate well. The thing that kept them on the move was material goods, a fiber for bowstrings, wood for bows. So this idea that, that uncontacted peoples are just these ravaging bands of, of starving savages is absolutely no, not no, the no, case. No. The problem but comes the when factor. the outside world comes in and starts to disrupt it. First of all, they get the diseases, which they can't cure, some of them. Second of all, their water supply is polluted because there's gold miners there putting mercury in the water. Then you have people shooting at them. Uh, these are the narco-traffickers or the gold miners. So yeah, life is nasty, brutish, and short when you have all these things pressing in on you. We live in a world uh, awash in demand for resources. All resources everywhere are craved, particularly by the Chinese, but also by the Americans, also by the Canadians, also there's European firms. So it's tough to be an isolated Indian tribe right now when the outside world is pressing in on all sides. And to answer your question about what do they want from the outside world, well, at the outset, they don't really want much of anything. Uh, maybe machetes being the obvious uh, exception. But, you know, 
iPhones are pretty addictive, and once you've come into contact with it, and once all your friends and all your tribe have iPads or iPhones, you want one too, which necessitates getting into the cash economy because iPhones don't run for free. So there's actual cases of, of, of men going off to the gold fields to get the cash necessary to pay for cell cards, uh, women prostituting themselves to get the money to pay for cell cards. So this, this very stupid notion that's been pushed by the big tech companies, particularly in the US, that all technology is good and life is better the more technology we have, is absolutely and categorically untrue. Mm. And, I, and smartphones tops machetes then, that's a sort of... Not at the outset. Right. A machete makes life better in the rainforest no matter where you are. A cell phone without a cell tower is useless. Right. Or a cell phone, if you're, you're the member of an uncontacted tribe and you have a cell phone and nobody else does and you don't speak the national language, it's not very much good to you. Right. Now, I wanna, don't want to sound like a Luddite, you know, that I'm anti-technology because we're using some of the best new technology like drones, uh, like GPSs to help these people map their lands. So technology is a two-edged sword, just like a sword. Uh, when Amerindians first came into contact with swords, it was on the beach of Guanahani, which is probably in the Bahamas, when Columbus landed. Of course, Columbus went to his grave thinking he discovered America, which would come as a surprise to all the Indians who were on the shore when he arrived. But when he pulled out his sword to proclaim this for the, the king and queen of Spain, the Indian chief who'd never seen metal grabbed it and cut him. And I thought, that's how we have to understand technology. It can be a force for good, it can be a force for bad. Typically it's a little of both and it depends how you use it and how you introduce it. So when Westerners come in and say, you know, worship our God, read our Bible, uh, here's an iPhone, here's a GPS, life's gonna be great, it usually isn't. Right, right, right. And all this knowledge being lost that they hold. Are there any systematic efforts to, to uh, record that in any way? You're talking to the right person because yeah. my organization has pioneered the Shaman's Apprentice program to get the young people, the children and the grandchildren to learn the old ways. Because when preliterate societies come into contact with the outside world, it's pretty overwhelming because we do have iPhones and iPads. But what we say to them is don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't lose your material culture, your medicinal wealth. And then 20 years later, when the white man has left, the missionaries have gone. You have no medicines, because we've seen this with the YYs in Guyana, who are worse off, and say, write it down. Yes, we have antibiotics. Uh, yes, we have x-rays. But you have treatments for diseases that we can't cure. Some of them may be effective. That's a question for the scientists in the lab as to whether it works or not. But there's a big movement afoot in the US, and I'm sure it's happening in Europe as well, to use hallucinogens, magical sacred plants, to treat incurable ailments. Now these things don't work all the time, but a lot of medicines don't work all the time. So when you see people cured of PTSD, which is a big problem in my country because of these terrible long-running wars, mm -hmm. when you see it used to treat and sometimes cure depression, uh, end-of-life anxiety, it's pretty powerful stuff. So this is not to say that the shamans have all the answers. They don't. But it shouldn't be a choice between the microchip and the medicine man. Uh, the sweet spot is somewhere in between. Right, right. And you had uh, an encounter with the shaman, that sort of eye-opening experience where you had a condition, right? Well, which one? It's been happening <laughs> for 30 years. Anyone. Uh, there's one you, 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 you talk about in the TED Talk that's quite a bit okay. viral on, on YouTube, yes. for instance. If you could tell I had injured that. my foot in a climbing uh, accident and it just didn't get better. And you know, as you enter middle age, your recuperative powers aren't what they, aren't, aren't what they were. But I've never been somebody who thought, well, medicine women have all the answers, I'm not gonna go to the doctor. So I went to a very good doctor, and she gave me uh, heat, and that didn't work, and I used cold, and I took non-prescription painkillers, I took prescription painkillers, I took anti-inflammatories, I had an orthopedic boot, none of this worked. So I figured, okay, well this is just, as you go through life, you get dents in your fenders. I'll, I'll live with this, but I was in a, a village not too long after that, and the shaman said, ah, you're limping, what's up? And I hurt my foot. He goes, okay, and, and I'll never forget this. He said, take off your shoe and give me your machete. <laughs> 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 Which I did. But he went over to a palm tree about three meters away, carved off a fern, 
threw it in the fire, singed it, applied it to my foot, singed my foot, it hurt like hell, threw it in a pot, boiled it, had me drink it, and the pain went away. And I thought, it's a miracle, I'm, I'm, I'm cured. Except that seven months later, it came back. Okay, I went back there, he singed the fern, put it on my foot, put it in a pot of water, I drank it, and that was three or four years ago, and it's never come back. Okay. So who would you rather be treated by? <laughs> no, no doubt. Uh, there's also a story about this green monkey frog. Uh, that's a very interesting story. Okay. A colleague of mine named Lauren McIntyre, not an ethnobotanist like me, a photojournalist, was lost on the Brazil-Peru border in 1969. And he was either rescued or kidnapped, depending on which version of the story, by a group of Indians famous for killing all white people. And they beckoned him deeper into the forest, and they entered a forest clearing and began dancing and pulled out these palm leaf baskets, which they opened up and took out these green monkey frogs. These are big suckers, are about this big. And they began licking them. Well, Lauren figured when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and he did. And it was highly hallucinogenic. So you may think that's, that's kind of weird and that's kind of cool, except now they're developing new means for treating high blood pressure based on peptides, based in proteins found in the green monkey frog. There's some evidence that these compounds are effective in treating drug-resistant Staph aureus, which is the greatest threat to our species. And it just goes to show, first of all, that we really don't know everything that's out there. And these things can have very powerful benefits for us if we protect the frog uh, and protect the forest, because you can't have frogs without forest, and protect the Indians who know which frogs to use and help them protect their knowledge, their forest, and their frogs. Right. And are the f pharmaceutical companies very keen on that? I mean, are they approaching you for, for the knowledge? Or? I've had some approaches, but not many. The pharmaceutical companies, by and large, are not interested in natural products. They did a book on this on Medicine Quest. Very complicated story. But it just goes to show that capitalism doesn't have all the answers because there's new drugs that should be developed, but they don't because it's expensive, because there's intellectual property rights issues, because there's political issues, uh, because they're short-sighted. All of these things factor in. But I, I like to think that this interest in natural healing, which is here in Scandinavia, in the US and Canada, is, is pushing them towards this. I like to think that when we find new and useful things, like this potential high blood pressure medicine from this hallucinogenic frog, it's an example of why they sh should pay attention. And also, if you follow the pharmaceutical industry, which I do, they're complaining, well, well the pipeline is kind of bare. We don't see where these new wonder drugs are gonna come from. Well, I know where they should come from. I know where they live now, yeah. and that's in these frogs and in these shaman's heads. You know, what, what nobody in the pharmaceutical industry that I've ever dealt with realize is that beta blockers, which are a billion dollar class of drugs, were based in part on compounds extracted from hallucinogenic mushrooms that my mentor Schultes collected in southern Mexico in 37, or that statins uh, for cholesterol uh, come from penicillium mold, which is the same mold that gave us penicillin, right. which is also the same mold that gives us blue cheese. Right. So this is the fungus that keeps on giving. Right, but there is no clear uh, border between sort of natural healing and, and and pharmaceutical products, or there shouldn't be, right? Look, it, it should be a, a, a continuum. The medical office of the future, if we get it right in, in, in Stockholm or, or Washington or wherever, is gonna be a physician and a nutritionist and a hypnotherapist and a masseuse and a shaman, because all of these all of these therapies do, do do something well. I mean, if acupuncture, I don't understand acupuncture, okay? Scientifically, it makes no sense to me, but I use it for some things. It works. Okay, mm -hmm. because it works. It doesn't right. work for everything. Right. Look, if you're in a terrible automobile accident in, in Stockholm, you don't want to go to a nutritionist. You don't want to go to a shaman. You want to go to a trauma surgeon. Mm -hmm. But if you have insomnia, or you have some sort of psychological uh, trauma from childhood, and you go to a, a physician, uh, she's gonna give you Allium, mm. right? Mm. You should be going to a, a, a psychiatrist or you should be going to a shaman. And there's a whole school of thought that said guys like me who are looking for the plants of the shamans are all wrong. The real genius of the shamans is a psychologist. Mm. But we don't really have any system to sort of translate the, the knowledge of the shamans into proper use in, in modern society, right? Well, just a few the, people like you b b traveling back and forth, but there's really no system to pick up the knowledge. That's the double-edged sword. We, we have a very acquisitive culture, we in the industrialized world, and we say, well, if they've got the cure for cancer, we want it. Well, the cure for cancer might be an alkaloid. Now, an alkaloid 
You can go into Kew and find plants collected 150 years ago by great explorers like Richard Spruce. Those alkaloids are still there. But I can also take you into the forest and slice uh, a very important medicinal tree, and the sap comes out red, orange, yellow, clear. So you know there's some wild chemistry happening. And by the time you get it back to the lab, that may be over. But much of the shamanic medicine is, is not chemical, or it's partially chemical, partially psychological. And if they're curing you with the placebo effect, I'm all for it. I prefer the placebo effect to the surgeon's knife. Yeah. But if you need something cut out, you don't want the placebo effect. That's why you need this buffet of approaches and why doctors are not gonna be running around with feathers through their nose giving you hallucinogenic snuff. That's not how they work. Right. That's the shaman's job. But your experience there with the foot and the shaman, could there have been, have been a component of placebo, you think, or, or was that a proper cure? Here's the question. Was it the stuff in the fern? Or was it the stuff in the fern plus the shaman's magic? Or was it the placebo effect because I had faith in the shaman? Or was it all three, which is what I suspect? Mm. And, um, you know, I did a TED Talk and I talked about this. And one of the things they tell you when you do a TED Talk, don't read the comments. <laughs> That's where the trolls live under the bridge. It's true in all media activity. I think. So this, this woman wrote, yeah, this idiot never heard of the placebo effect. Well, you know what? I only had 18 minutes to work with, and I had to cram 35 years of research, so I didn't cover all the implications. Right. What's important about this story is ferns are considered essentially chemically inert. There's very few medicines made from ferns because, according to scientists, there's no chemicals in them. So this might be a new chemical. It might be that this man just tricked me into believing that I need to get better, and I did. Well, are you interested in, in therapeutic pathway? Are you interested in results? My foot doesn't hurt. I'm interested in the results. Sure. Intellectually, I'm interested in both, but my foot doesn't hurt. That was priority number one. Right. Uh, or number two, is it some combination of the two, as I said? And here's where it's interesting. Uh, while this was happening, there was a shaman of a completely different tribe, and he said, oh yeah, that's, I use that plant for the same thing. Right. So it says to me, there's more happening than just, you know, this guy got lucky. It was an established or, recipe, if you will. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. So I have a problem with people who misunderstand what these Indians do or misunderstand what ethnobotanists do and say, well, that's not science because you didn't take it to the lab and run it through blah, blah, blah. And I you said, get that sort of reaction, sort of suspicion? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes. Mm. But that's a fundamental misunderstanding of science. Science begins with an ethno botanical hypothesis where you say, okay, possibly this fern has something in it which can use to treat and possibly cure. That's N equals one, that's one sample. A scientist does not conclude that because she or he saw something once that, that that's the truth. A, a real scientist says, that's interesting. I wonder what would happen if I tried it again and again, if I talked to other shamans, if we tried it in rats or guinea pigs or people, what have you, what have you. That's the scientific process. It's not to say, okay, one Indian did it to one white guy and that's proof that it's always gonna work. Right, right. And what can, can be done now? I mean, are, what are the efforts to salvage these last lost tribes, if you will, the, the, the few ones that hasn't been in contact yeah. with the outside world and so on. Well, the, there... sec the secret sauce, as, as, as I describe it, is, is to protect the uncontacted tribes is the contacted tribes. Because all uncontacted tribes are surrounded by contacted tribes. And they know who they are. They're, they're related. They, they, their languages are often related. There's probably some contact going on in there. But obviously we don't want to make contact with uncontacted tribes. It's sort of like the US Vietnam strategy where we had to destroy the village to save it sort of right. stuff. No, we don't, want to, we don't want to go there. So it's working with the contacted tribes to make maps, to train them as park guards, and to be able to put some money in their pockets because they're in the cash economy to buy machetes or cell phones or cell cards or what have you. Now, there's not many options open to these people. You know, they're not gonna go work in, in Bogota or Brasilia and then go back to the bush and live like a forest Indian. So we pay our park arts. And what we're trying to do is get the government to put them on the payroll because frankly, they have more at stake in this than we do. These people are protecting their headwaters mm -hmm. and they should be supporting. We're not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars here. Very little money they need to keep them in the bush if they, if they so decide to stay there. Another thing is ecotourism, 
which we don't do. We're not involved in ecotourism. It's very complicated stuff. But because these people live in the forest, because they know the plants, they're shamans, apprentices, they learn from the masters, uh, they make great tour guides, typically. But again, it's up to them if they want to do that. Another thing is we do these mapping projects, and we pay them and train them as cartographers, because what that results in is not just a map, but somebody who understands the cash economy, understands how to work with the outside world, and most important of all, understands how to use technology mm -hmm. to protect the forest and the culture instead of being lured out for a better life in the capital city. And all of us who've been in capital cities and tropical countries know the slums is where those people live that come out of the bush seeking a better life, mm -hmm. and they seldom find one. There's not much social mobility in these countries. And, and, and missionaries come in and say, put pants on and move to the capital city, and you'll have two cars and air conditioning. It doesn't really pan out that way very often. Right. And which countries are doing best in this regard, in sort of having well, a Well, I've worked from Mexico approach. to Argentina, but I run the Amazon conservation team, and our focus is obviously the Amazon. But our two major countries are Colombia and Suriname, for very different reasons. You know, Americans, as I said, think the Amazon is only in Brazil. It's not true. Brazil is 60% of the Amazon, but there's eight, eight other countries there. So it's a mistake to focus only on Brazil because things change. And things we could do in Brazil 10 years ago, uh, it's more difficult now because they're a very xenophobic government. Things we couldn't do in Colombia 10 years ago because there was a civil war, we can now do because that's 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 been dialed back. So. You know, if you want to be nimble, you also need to be fluid. You need to be able to move around. Mm. And and it takes different, a lot of different approaches to sort of exactly. solve yeah. this problem. You know, in Suriname, they have a wonderful saying: "To every complicated question, there is an answer which is both simple and wrong." <laughs> that's true in every every that's field. That's true anywhere. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and if you look at these these tribes and the way they interact with their environment, I mean, the way you describe it, it's sort of a harmony. They, they don't really destroy their habitat right. the way right. we tend to do otherwise. Uh, but if you look at anthropological history, I mean, people have always sort of moved along and waste and ex made animals go extinct and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so is there a risk that we might be romanticizing the impact they have on their environment as well? You know, I gave a lecture uh, recently on the, on the fall of the Greek and Roman empires. And when you look at that, people talk about disease, lead in the drinking water. I disagree. I think a major cause, not the only cause, but a major cause, which is seldom discussed in history books, is destruction of the environment. Because what was their most important strategic commodity? Before. It was wood. Yeah. Right? They fought with wooden weapons. They hid behind wooden shields. They used wooden catapults. They cooked over wood fires. They traveled on wooden ships and wooden carts. There's no more wood. They couldn't do that. Right. So if you tried to run the U.S. military and said, okay, but no petroleum, you'd have a similar situation. So yes, it's important to realize that the human species has a penchant for fouling our own nest. Uh, it wasn't the Indians that uh, wiped out the mastodons or the elephant birds uh, in Madagascar anytime soon. So yes, people have always wiped stuff out. But when there's very few people living in a very big forest, you have a lot more leeway. So yes, your point is well taken that we shouldn't romanticize that these are uh, noble savages and they don't cut down trees and they're all eating tofu, that's obviously not true. But it's also true they know the forest far better than any scientist. And you're trying to figure out how to use the forest, you're trying to figure out how to protect the forest. They don't have all the answers, but they have many of them. And so again, it gets back to my point about the microchip and the medicine man. That's the sweet spot. But when you have 10,000 years of wisdom on one side and you have maybe a couple of decades of wisdom on the other because we wanted to go in there and cut everything down too, why not honor, celebrate, protect, and utilize their wisdom uh, first and foremost, which is something that Westerners are sort of late to the party at realizing the value of this knowledge. Right. Mark Plotkin, thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.